Okay, good evening. Because of the most recent development in the world, because of the urgency of the matter, I decided to focus on the coronavirus instead of the regular shiur that we have on Tehillim. There's a war going on, a war against an invisible enemy. This invisible enemy happens to be a very, very small pathogen, as they call it. This pathogen, this disease, is highly contagious. It is so small that in order to see a little bit of what it looks like, it, you need a very special microscope, a microscope called an electron microscope. Now, epidemics and pandemics have been around Unfortunately, quite a few times in the past where millions of people died as a result. They could be very, very deadly. And the world is looking desperately for a vaccine, for a cure. They're still not sure how to deal with it and when it's going to go away, when it's going to be controlled. Judaism, however, looks at it a little bit differently. As the Prophet says, Let's investigate. Let's do our own research. Not an investigation or research into the pathology, but into our ways. Let's examine ourselves. Perhaps there's something that we're not doing right. It is always important to keep in mind a very important principle in Judaism that en mikriyut. There's no such a thing as something happening by chance by coincidence, for no reason whatsoever. Everything happens for some reason. We may not always know the reason, but it's definitely incumbent upon us to investigate, to try to figure it out. Perhaps we will be able to at least figure out some of the reasons behind it. Now the rabbis do tell us there is a list of reasons of why epidemics occur. Why is there a plague? There are various reasons listed, but I'm not going to get into that. There are those who want to say that this is definitely a sign that we're coming very close to Mashiach. That may be so, but I still don't want to talk about that. Instead, I would like to focus on what is it that we could learn, the moral lessons, the valuable lessons that can be learned from this very, very tragic situation. It's interesting how despite all the great advancement in technology that man has been able to show, he's been able to reach the moon and even beyond the moon. Suddenly, this man who has achieved so much in technology appears vulnerable Suddenly, he's panicking. He has to follow instructions. He's afraid for his life. What's interesting about this whole situation is, look how great powers, the greatest of them all, the United States, China, these great powers are being humbled. Great economies are being paralyzed. Man's confidence and pride has been shaken to the core. In order to be able to begin to figure this out, Judaism puts an emphasis on looking at the name. How is this being described? What is it called? Interesting how it is called Corona, because it has a little bit of that kind of an appearance under the microscope. But that's a very important clue as to what is going on. Why call it Corona? Just because of its shape. For those who may be a little bit familiar with Kabbalah, in the Kabbalah we have the Sefirot, the various attributes of God through which He manages this world. The very first one at the very top is called Keter. It's called a crown. Yes, the Corona, a crown. This Keter, represents the will of God, the very first step, perhaps if we can call it so, that God demonstrated His will, His interest, His desire in creating this world. It is the very beginning of everything. 
it's interesting how, if you look at the numerical value of Keter, it's 620 in Hebrew. What's 620? 620 represents the 613 commandments that Jews need to observe, plus the seven Noahide laws. Perhaps there's some connection to the commandments, perhaps there's some link to God's instructions, perhaps we haven't been following His instructions. It's all about following instructions these days. Which instructions? What about God's instructions? The Kabbalah teaches that if the Keter is damaged, the crown of God is damaged, then that same word, Keter, if you switch the letters a little bit, it becomes Karet. Karet means death. It means to be cut off. If the crown of God is damaged, God forbid, there can be death. Karet, of course, can eventually be transformed into the Keter. If man take whatever action is necessary to correct their ways, then they can bring back the Keter. The Kabbalah goes on to teach that, God forbid, during these times of epidemics, the Malach HaMashchit, the Mechabel, the destructive angel, the attribute of justice, has free reign. And whenever that happens, the righteous and the wicked may lose their life, because that attribute of justice does not distinguish between the righteous and the ones who are not so righteous. He has free reign. So it is definitely a dangerous time to be in such a place, to be around where the plague is. You definitely have to be very careful. But going back to the etymology, into the source of the word Corona, most people think, okay, Corona comes from Latin. Corona means crown. But the, the origin of Corona is really from the Greek word Coronis, which has more to do with a curve, a crown being circular. Just like the word Cornus is also from the same root. And these words really stem from the original Hebrew word Keren. Keren means a horn, that which stands out. Same with a garland, the word garland or wreath also comes from the same root, keren, something that stands out. What is there about something that stands out? What could be wrong with that? What's so unusual about something that stands out? We just read in the Torah section of Kitisa that the Jewish people are to be counted in a very unusual way. Even though the Torah says, Kitisai Rosh, take a head count, instead of telling us, count, it uses the words, elevate the head, take a head count. Why use this kind of a language? The Torah goes on to tell us that you're not just going to count them one, two, three, you better be careful to use a coin, a machzita shekel, a half a shekel. So it has to be a count done in an indirect way even though it's called a head count, but you're not going to count the head. Why? So that there should not be a negif. God forbid, you don't want there to be an epidemic. You don't want there to be a plague if you actually count the heads individually. You don't want to do that. When you're counting a lot of people, you want to count them through some other means. In this case, the Torah says, use a coin. And this coin is not an ordinary coin. It's a half a shekel. So the question is, why? Count it this way, when well, why use a half a shekel, not a complete shekel? And what if the rich want to give more? No, everybody is equal. Everybody has to give the exact same amount, a machzita shekel, a half a shekel. Why? When Jews learn the halachot, the rules about mixtures, what happens when you have something that's forbidden to consume mixed in a minute amount? in uh, something which is permissible to eat, let's say the prohibition against mil mixing meat and milk. You have a drop of milk that fell into the pot. You're making a stew. So there's quite a few rules on how to deal with this kind of a situation. If we're dealing with a very minute amount, sometimes that minute amount is just annulled. It's canceled. It pretty much disappears. It doesn't affect 
the food that you're eating and you can eat it, go ahead and eat it. Even though they're mixed right now, two things that should not be together, something that's forbidden for us to eat. But if it's a very minute amount, there's enough of the permissible food to cancel it out, then you pretty much can go ahead and eat it and not worry about it. There are many, many details in these laws, but I just want to bring out this important point that sometimes you don't have to worry because it's batel. Bitul means it's cancelled. It's so minute that we don't consider it a serious matter. However, there are times when something is not batel. Something is not cancelled because it's so important. It is counted separately. It is something that is of great value. Something like that is not batel even in a thousand. Even if you have many, many more against it, the laws of cancellation of annulment don't apply because of its importance. It stands out by itself. The Kabbalah teaches that one should be careful with those kind of things that stand out. Even if we're not talking about the laws of mixtures, anytime you have something that stands out, the Ainara, the evil eye, can affect it. Because it stands out, it is important. It can be seen. And as a result of that, somehow that negative energy that we call the evil eye, which I have a separate lecture about, can affect it. And therefore, the Zohar continues to tell us that any time we're dealing with an epidemic, don't stand out. Don't just walk anywhere by yourself. You don't want to stand out. The angel of death is around. That is what the Zohar talks about and therefore tells us, be careful during such times. Don't stand out. What exactly does this evil eye do? this negative energy called Ainara, that it affects something. Basically what happens when the evil eye affects an individual, he feels weak, he feels sick. What has happened is that the Shefai Loki, that divine flow that is continuously coming down from above, like an umbilical cord that is giving sustenance to everything, somehow is severed momentarily or it is weakened, and when that's weakened, the immune system in our physical bodies is weakened as well. And that is why we become sick from an Ainara. Obviously, people become sick for all kinds of reasons, many, many times because of the food they ate, as Maimonides explains. But there are some times when it's not really completely our fault. People looked at us in a certain way. The individual stood out, perhaps because he talked about his money, perhaps because he looks so beautiful, and somehow somebody with that negative energy, not everybody has it, got a look at him and he's able to somehow weaken him. Of course, this can be dealt with, it could be eliminated, he can be cured, but in the meantime, he doesn't know why he feels the way he does. That negative energy took hold of him. But briefly, what is this negative energy? This negative energy this individual who has that kind of an eye is not interested in being kind. He's a very selfish individual. He's very unhappy when people are doing well. He has an eye, ra'a, a negative, a bad eye. He may not even know it himself. And therefore, when he looks at something or at somebody that stands out, it is a perfect match. That something is standing out feeling so important, feeling so good about itself, and here's someone who cares more about himself than about someone else. So it's like a match where that negative energy that only thinks of itself is able to hurt that individual who may be an otherwise good person, but something about him is standing out. And that is why it attacks it. And it unfortunately has a very negative influence over it. But speaking about things that stand out, what does that remind us? It reminds us about the quality called arrogance. One who's arrogant wants to stand out. He wants his qualities to stand out. He thinks so highly of himself, just like that kidding, the horn. Remember, we just said about the horn, that horn stands out. It protrudes, it wants to be seen. And it happens to be that this particular quality or characteristic called arrogance is the one that's the most hated by God. God hates those who think so highly of themselves. Why? Because, amongst other things, 
this particular mitah, this particular quality, is the one that distances man from God the most of anyone else. One who is arrogant thinks of himself so highly, he thinks of himself as independent, he knows it all, he can do anything he wants, he has all the money, all the power, nothing can stop him. You see how this quality can really cause the human being to become so distant from God. He doesn't even realize it, but little by little he forgets about God. And that's what the Torah warns us. You may become haughty and you will forget. Why should you become haughty? Because you will become very rich, prosperous, successful. Many reasons why people become haughty. And as a result of all that haughtiness, that arrogance, people uh, just stop being observant of the mitzvot. People don't care anymore about spirituality, about that which is divine. They become more into themselves, more materialistic. And that is why the Torah continues to tell us and we say it every day in our prayers. Be careful. Be careful that your heart does not deviate from the right path and you go on to worship other gods. I was thinking about this statement, but wait a minute. Idolatry today is pretty much not existent, even though there is some. But in the past, there was something called idolatry, paganism. So the Torah is warning us back then, that's understandable. But what about in the future? Why would the Torah make such a statement in the future? Into the future, be careful that you don't go worship other idols. I think Rabbi Abraham Tversky pretty much defines it very well when he says, what exactly is idolatry? He says, idolatry is essentially a system where a person creates his own gods and erects his own ethical, moral system to conform to his desires. So a lot of people, a lot of nations, governments, have erected some sort of system that suits their needs, what they want, what they would like to see for themselves, not necessarily what is right in the eyes of God. So all this is paganism. It is worshipping a God that is man-made, not the real God. Why would they want to do that? Well, that goes back to the first sin, the primordial sin with the serpent telling Adam and Chava, if you eat from this tree, from this fruit, you will be like gods. You will become independent. You won't have a need for God to tell you what to do, to dictate to you how to live your life. So it is part of human nature to want to get away from that dependence on God and to erect for himself what he would prefer. And of course, what people prefer is based on their desires, their physical desires, which many, many times, of course, is totally not compatible with what God wants. If you recall, there's also a very interesting verse in Mishlein Proverbs. What does this arrogance do? Gavat adam tashpilen. When man feels great about himself, he's arrogant, he's independent, he thinks he can handle everything on his own, that same arrogance is what's going to bring him down. It is the arrogance of people that one day will bring them down those that feel that they can do anything they want. At some point, either that individual or that country is going to come tumbling down because of that arrogance. Who is a good example of that? Titus, Titus, the Roman Emperor, who was involved in the destruction of the Temple, Jerusalem. He was a very, very arrogant man. He thought that he could just do anything and he was invincible. And according to Jewish tradition, what killed him, what humbled him, was a small flea, a small insect. God says, I don't need to send an army against you. I don't need to send missiles and tanks and soldiers. I have a small little soldier called a flea. And our tradition says that that flea just went through his nostrils and landed in the brain, and eventually he died from it. Even though if you look up Titus, you will see that according to most opinions, he died from fever. Well, it could be that he had fever too, because insects can carry fever. And the fact that this was in the area of the brain, he could have developed a tumor too. Either way, the point here is, yes, even little insects can humble the mighty. Look what happens to Metzorah. 
another individual in the Torah. They translate it as a leper, even though it's not exactly leprosy. It was a discoloration of the skin, whether it was the skin of this individual, whether it was the clothes, whether it was the house. A discoloration was a sign from heaven that something was wrong. And for the most part, a Mitzorah had this symptom of Tzara'at, let's call it leprosy, for one of three reasons. Either he was a gossiper, Lashonara, which is negative speech about others, or he was very, very arrogant, or he was very greedy. There was different kinds of discolorations, as you can see the Torah pretty much spells out the various kinds, happened for different reasons. But look at this arrogance in Ashonara, which is really what I'm focusing on more today. What does this tell you about the person who thinks so highly of himself, and as a result of that, that is why he speaks negatively about others. He looks down on others. He makes fun about other people. How could he come to that? How could you do something like that because you think so highly of yourself? A person who doesn't really think too much of himself is capable of seeing another individual as an equal. Why not? Why can't you see him as an equal to you? What makes you think you're better than him? It's the arrogance, the arrogance that enables the individual to say all kinds of terrible things about other people. And that is a very serious offense, Lashonara, negative talk, it is a big problem. It causes tremendous divisiveness about, amongst people. So what would happen to this Mitzvah? <laughs> Something very familiar. He would be quarantined until it would be determined whether he was clean, not clean, whether this was real leprosy or not, whether this makes him impure or not. The priest would have to make that determination, a priest who was qualified to analyze what this individual had, whether it was serious or not. And he could have been quarantined for 14 days or more until he was able to come back into the camp. He was pretty much quarantined, he was all by himself. What for? Well, when you're by yourself, you have a lot of time to think. Why did this happen to me? Perhaps I did something wrong. People don't have the time to reflect on what they're doing. Is it right or wrong? They just are an automatic drive. They don't stop to think, perhaps it was not nice of me what I did the other day, that I yelled, that I cursed, that I spoke so bad, that I belittled someone, insulted. People don't reflect. In Metzora, part of his, I guess you can call it rehabilitation, was to take the time off, 14 days or more, to think about his situation and mend his ways if necessary. This Lashon Ra, this negative speech, is a very, very serious offense. But besides the seriousness of it, we have to figure out why exactly people are so easy with speaking negatively about others. Why does it come so easy to them? It has also to do with an Ainara. It has to do with the fact that people are either unhappy with themselves, insecure, and therefore that's what makes them feel good, in speaking bad about others. But it's more than that, it's deeper than that. It has to do with the opposite trait of kindness, whereas kindness is being unselfish, is thinking about someone else. One who is involved in speaking bad about others is really only thinking about himself, only focused on himself. And this is a negative quark, a negative force, the opposite of kindness. And therefore, it comes easy to him to look down at others, to look at those who are weaker as individuals who perhaps are just unsuccessful in life, just that, you know, they're not as good as him. It comes easy to them to make fun, to look down, to ridicule others. So getting back to the original question, so why was the count done through a Machzita Shekel? Well, number one, we don't want anybody to stand out, so it had to be done indirect. Not the head counts, because that stands out. We don't want to hurt anyone. And it has already happened during the time of David, where people were counted. It was a mistake, but it happened. There was a big plague. So you don't want to count. You don't want to consider all those individuals who stand out, but count them indirectly. And using a half a coin would remind you, we're all incomplete. We need each other. 
we're not complete, we're not a complete shekel, we're only a half a shekel. Human beings need to coexist. They depend on each other. And why can't the rich give more? Because you're not any better just because you have more money. No, 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 no. We're all the same, we're all going to give the same, we're all going to contribute towards this cause in the same way. Because we're all the same. We're all created in the image of God. Be very careful with prejudice. God created all of us. Why look down on someone? Why talk mad about him? You're only half. We need each other. You want to see how people think of themselves? A real example. During these kind of times, during these kind of desperate situations, you have people in the supermarkets fighting about toilet paper. Of all things, it's not even food. They're fighting about toilet paper. I saw a picture of someone who had a whole bunch of toilet paper in their wagon, and this other person who was arguing with them asked them nicely, just, can you give me one? And they said, no. Why couldn't you give them one? You have so many. Why? Because of selfishness, being focused on themselves. And that is why the rabbis tell us Mitzurah, the word Mitzurah in Hebrew, really is composed of the word Sarut Ayn, a narrow eye. Narrow meaning they only see themselves, they don't see anybody else. But he's a human being too. Why not treat him as, as an equal? So it is during these times when you actually can see the difference in people and how they behave with each other. During desperate times, whether they will help each other unite together or each one will be for himself. The Torah goes on to tell us there is one powerful remedy against all these evil forces to drive away witchcraft, to stop the plague. It's a very interesting remedy. It's called the Ketoret. Now, loosely translated Ketoret means incense. But what's in the incense? All kinds of ingredients. One of them was Helbena. I think the English translation is Galbenum. And this Galbenum has a very unusual smell. Not such a good smell. The rabbis tell us that this represents those individuals amongst us who may not be so good, who may not be so spiritual, who perhaps did not behave themselves. No, when it comes to prayer, you want to be with them, you want to bring them close, you want to inspire them, you want to teach them, you want to be united, even with them, if at all possible. Why? Because God loves unity. Despite the differences, and there are differences between people, many, many differences, unity is so special, unity is so powerful. The rabbis tell us, for example, look at the difference in the generation of David and Ahab. David was a righteous man, a righteous king, but still, in his generation, they didn't win all the battles. They lost many, many times because the people of that generation, even though they were righteous and observant, they were not united. They spoke negatively about each other. Whereas during the time of Ahab, they were into idolatry, not very religious at all, but they were united. And because they were united, they won. They actually won the battles. It's interesting how unity is so powerful that when the attribute of justice looks down on the people who are not doing the right thing when it comes to observance of the Torah, it just looks away. It doesn't forget about them, but it looks away. In other words, it will not judge them and hurt them because they're united. And I once explained the reason for this, the verse in Mishle, a beautiful verse that says, Hatred, animosity, begets quarrels. When people don't like each other, there's always going to be quarrels. It somehow provokes quarrels from time to time. But if you have love, it covers up the faults. It doesn't look at the faults. It ignores them. It puts them aside. When there's love, there's unity, God says, I will look away for now. I will not point at their faults. I will not accuse them. Look at the power of unity. So it is that power of unity that we put into the Ktoret that drives away all that impurity or all that punishment, that plague. So now let's look at the world scene. The world is united, yes, in fighting this common enemy. 
how special it would be if they would be united for other causes all the time. How much power they would really have. Man's power lies in the unity, uniting all the forces. Everyone has something to contribute. If that would be something that we would emphasize, it would make God proud of us. We would accomplish so much more. Yes, this disease is a common enemy to all mankind, but there is a more powerful enemy that is really the greatest enemy of all. The enemy that we should all be fighting at all times, and that is the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. That is the enemy that, unfortunately, not too many people are interested in fighting. They're actually befriending him, going along with him, and doing all what he wants them to do. So now we have to figure out what is there that we can do to heal ourselves. Is there anything that we can do? In order to answer this question, I'm going to ask another question. It is very interesting that right after the Jewish people received the Torah, they were very much praised when they were so willing. They said, now seven Ishma God, yes, we will go ahead and fulfill everything that you ask of us to do. We will observe the mitzvot. We will follow what it says. We will comply with the, with the words. We take it upon ourselves and upon our children to do your word. It's interesting how not too much after that, not too much longer after that, they fell. They fell very, very low when they worshipped the golden calf. How could this happen so quickly? That question perhaps we'll deal with another time. But the fact that they fell is obvious. They lost so much. They committed a terrible sin. They heard the voice of God. They saw incredible miracles to go worship this idol, which was against, of course, the Torah. It was something very, very bad. My question, therefore, was, since this is such a terrible fall, such a terrible mistake, why did God let this happen? It was really a miscalculation. God could have prevented it. He could have sent Moses down right away. Because according to those who worship the golden calf, he was late. All right, God, you know that this is about to happen. Why not prevent it? Why let them sink so low? There is a famous saying, the rabbis tell us, the before the onset of a disease, the cure already exists. The cure exists before the onset of the disease, yes. Why should the refuan, why should the cure be there before? Once there's a disease, go find the cure. Why does God have to create the cure before the disease? The reason for this is because God knows what's going to be in the future. In the future, human beings will fall repeatedly, many, many times. And as a result of that, they may come to the biggest fall of all. What's the biggest fall of all? Not the sin itself, but yush, despair. People will feel, well, I've fallen so low, I've sank so low, I have no chance to come out of this. That's it. I'm a sinner. I committed all these terrible wrongs. There's no way for me to come out of this. That's the biggest fall. That despair. Don't despair. Never despair. The refuah, therefore, the cure that has been around even before the potential of sin, is called the shuvah, it's called repentance. Hashem says, I have already prepared this because I created you. I know that you are capable of this. I know that you are susceptible. I have already created the refuah, the biggest refuah, the biggest and most powerful cure of all is the shuvah, is repentance. Be careful not to despair, not to feel bad. Be hopeful, be happy, because God is on your side. He loves you, and He wants you to take the first step, and He'll help you with all the other steps that you still need to take. But you take the first one. But that will not happen so easily if you despair. So don't despair. So this incident of the golden calf was an example of falling so low, but still being given the opportunity to correct it and not to despair. That is why you find many, many times the prophets calling to the Jewish people, return, 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 even though you've done so much wrong, 
Never, never give up hope, never despair. You can always do a U-turn and come right back. But in order to be able to avail yourself and to use this cure, this very powerful remedy called Teshuvah Repentance, one has to have a good doses of an avow of humility. Look at the red heifer. A very interesting command of the red heifer. But what happens to that red heifer? It's burnt to ashes. It's the ashes that's used to drive away the impurity. Ashes represents humility. It is the power of humility that can bring one to understand that this is the right thing for him to do, is to return to God, to do Teshuvah. Without that humility, he would never think of doing something like this. He would never even stop for a moment to think perhaps that he did something wrong, and the more so to, to, to take action to fix it. You need humility, otherwise you can offer someone the best remedy if he's arrogant, he doesn't think he made a mistake, he's wrong, he's never going to take that medication. What humility will do, one of the first things that humility will enable the person to do, is something very special, and that's called amitpalel al-chavero, the wood sarich l'oto davarun enat chila. Whenever you need something, but your friend also needs the same thing, whether it's a marriage partner, livelihood, health, and you both need the same thing, but you pray for him instead of praying for yourself. What will happen is God says, you're so kind that you think of him before yourself, that your focus is on him, your prayers are directed for him. I will answer your prayer first if you need the exact same thing. That's an incredible thing to do, to think of someone else. You need the exact same thing, but your focus, your prayer, your attention is on someone else. How could someone have this kind of an attitude only because he's somewhat humble? He therefore treats another individual as an equal. And therefore he's capable of praying for him. That's kindness, the opposite of selfishness. Humbleness will enable one to see his faults. And when you see your faults, you're not going to focus on somebody else's faults. You're not going to talk bad about him. In order to help people who have this weakness of Lashonara, of talking negatively about others, the first thing is train yourself to be just a little bit more humble. Besides learning all the laws of what you can say and not say, besides all of that, be a little bit humbler. Realize that no one is perfect. If anything, look at your faults and then you will see that perhaps he's even better than you. So humbleness will help us greatly control, hopefully, the Lashonara, the negative speech. Humbleness will also help us with unity. Humbleness will also help us bond with God. And the reason why this is so important, the bond with God, is because when we go to the doctor, which sometimes we need to do, we sometimes forget that the real doctor, the real boss, is God. So he's the one that ultimately does wonders, miracles, where doctors, human beings, as good as they may be, cannot do. So we always have to turn to him in the end. There's a very cute story about an individual who apparently was very ill and went to consult with his rabbi what to do. He should perhaps give him a blessing. He was in great need of a cure. And the rabbi told him, listen, you need to go speak to the professor in the city of Anipoli. The city of Anipoli was far away, but he was willing to undertake this trip to go see the professor. Now the professor meant in those days the head doctor, the main doctor. He arrives at the town and he sees that this is not such a big city. Well, that's where I was sent, the Bible told me to go here. So he asked the people, where does this professor live? He says, there is no professor here, there's no doctor here. And he goes, this is a small little village, a small little town. He says, I can't understand then what do you guys do when you get sick? He says, we don't have a doctor, we have no choice, we turn to God. There is no doctor, there's no professor here. So he went back to his rabbi, he was disappointed. Rabbi, you made me take this long trip to this place. They don't even have one doctor. So the rabbi looks at him and says, come on, don't be such a fool. Did you ask them what they do when they get sick? And he says, yes, they just turn to God. He says, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. That is what you need to learn. 
not to depend just on human beings, is to ultimately remember he's the one that gave you life to begin with. Don't you owe him a thank you? Don't you ever pray to him? Why don't you ask him, turn to him? He can do it all. What I think is a good thing to do at this time, during this very, very serious epidemic, is to read chapter 91 in Tehillim. That particular chapter is very, very focused on these type of things. 91, Sadi Caliph. It's also a good idea to focus more on the blessings that we make, especially Asher Yatsar. Jews make a special blessing when we come out of the bathroom, where we thank God and appreciate the fact that the plumbing is functioning. A lot of people are on dialysis. A lot of people have all kinds of problems. We shouldn't just take it for granted that tomorrow will be the same as today. Our health depends, of course, on us, but it also depends on God. And if everything is good, we just come out of the bathroom, we say Hashem Yatsan, which is a beautiful blessing that describes the great miracles that go on in the body on a regular basis, day and night, for all our life. It's something that we should not forget about and always think about and thank God for it. So it's a good idea to focus on that because we have a tradition that whoever says that particular blessing with kavanah, with real intent, he will not be sick, hopefully. So this is definitely something that we should take up on ourselves. Just like to finish with a verse that is very befitting for a time, and it could be that Isaiah meant this for the end of days. I'm going to read it in English, but this refers to the Pasuk, Lecha mi bo bechadrecha. Go, my people, come into your chambers and close your door about you. Hide but for a moment until the wrath passes. Yes, this is a time of wrath. And we have to hide a little bit. We have to go into our chambers. Apparently, there is mention of this in the end of days, but it will be momentarily until the wrath will pass. Don't stick out. Don't stand out during this time. Be very careful. Be humble. Obviously, the Torah reminds us, one has to be very careful with his health. One has to be very watchful. One cannot take matters so lightly. This is serious. So you definitely have to follow the advice of doctors and experts. But in the end, let's not forget what this time is are all about. The commentaries explained that what Isaiah meant by chambers is not just your chambers, your rooms in the house, it's the chambers of the heart. Go into the chambers of your heart and examine them. Perhaps you've been too arrogant and selfish and do not treat others as an equal. See what there is to change. Engage in good deeds, in doing for others, in being kind. These are the types of things that God wants to see during these days. And as the rabbis tell us, this is what will protect us. Because in the end of days, there will be a birur, there will be a filtration. And like Moses said after the sin of the golden calf, Mila Shem Elai, who is on God's side, let him approach me. I want to see him. I want to see who is on God's side, who is the one that's taking up the case for God. In order to be able to be on God's side, let us not forget that the real crown, the real corona, is the crown of God. And it's that crown which God will soon place on the head of Mashiach when he anoints him, God willing, very soon. Amen.